Hello um, and welcome to a new uh, podcast video series. Uh, my name is Denis Guarda and we, I'm here to talk uh, about uh, um, our series of interviews with global thought leaders and profiling them on the context of citiesabc.com, a platform for cities and citizens that is enabling um, a new way of looking at digital transformation for our world that is uh, going through a lot of transformation, but as well for a lot of challenges, especially when it comes to one of the biggest health crises in history, and as well a lot of geopolitical circumstances. So this video podcast is, is building the context of uh, profiling people that have been building projects, um, projects that are affecting our society, creating solutions, but as well tackling uh, specific issues in the way we touch um, technology, the way we touch society, communities, the way we build different things, and the way we use new um, innovations like uh, blockchain, AI, cryptocurrencies, and a lot of other things to create more value. Um, this is part of the citiesabc.com platform that we create to the global team. And uh, we have been growing this channel and uh, profiling uh, very diverse profiles of people that are really fantastic and they have a fantastic energy and as well inspirational part of them. So today we have with us Michael Healy, that is a, a citizen of the world, living actually right now as we speak um, in, in Dubai, but as well between uh, living between Indonesia and as well someone from Singapore, and as well as the founder and CEO of Unit Ventures, a platform that is creating a marketplace, a global marketplace for creating meaningful jobs and solving inequality and as well trying to build new solutions in terms of using blockchain uh, crypto solutions and, and as well a lot of innovation in this area to allow business and individuals to create solutions around tokenization digital assets and a lot of different areas so michael is a full stack web developer that has been working in building different solutions uh, from uh, self software development for apps, both in Android and mobile and, and the Apple Store, but as well um, building a couple of different projects and probably uh, is one of, the, I think in terms of uh, probably the biggest things that is part of his profile is that he was a fin finalist of the Phil Peter Thiel Phil Fellowship, okay, which is a quite a big thing, and as well the silver medal in the Mathematical Olympians. And as well, probably one of the things that he did as well that I think it's quite interesting is the, the one of the apps for WikiLeaks. And as well, he's been living among different countries and uh, uh, he's been working with a lot of big brands as well, from Google to KPMG and a lot of other things. So welcome to our podcast, Michael. It's a pleasure to have you here. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Dennis. And it's an honor to be a part of your interview series. And yeah, I'm excited to share. Okay, so Michael, I'm particularly interested, and I want to start with the, with the culture. I have a huge passion for Southeast Asia, um, and I've been actually working a lot there, uh, both between Singapore and Malaysia in particular, but I've been as well starting to explore Indonesia and a lot of different things. So I would like to, being you a Singaporean, that is probably, a, a, well, at the moment, I think is one of the most successful countries in the world in terms of balance between all the rankings that we have global-wise and in terms of smart cities and in terms of uh, um, infrastructure. I would like to have a bit of your background um, as well from an education, from as well growing in Singapore and as well growing in Southeast Asia. And as well, Singapore in the last 30 years became a powerhouse in terms of innovation, in terms of fintech, in terms of a lot of different things. But I think you are still very young. How did you go through all of that? And I think it's interesting to see as well that growing in a country or a small country in this case, but very dynamic and very powerful in a lot of areas. So I would like to have your background on that uh, specific context. Definitely. So um, I grew up in Singapore and lived there till I was 15. Uh, my, my father's British and my mom's from Singapore. Um, they, they, they are also involved in the technology, technology field and have a software background. Um, when I was building apps in Singapore, so I've been building apps since I was 14, there wasn't much of a technology ecosystem there. So I think it was only after 2011, 2012, when I had left um, living in Singapore, that um, the technology and the startup ecosystem, the innovation in Singapore more or less picked up. Um, in, in terms of how Singapore has managed to um, have such a big uh, reputation and, and name in terms of the global 
uh, innovation sphere. I think it's done a really good job in bringing in top talent from around the world and investing in uh, innovative companies setting up there. Um, I, it's starting to support local talents and local entrepreneurs. I think it needs to um, focus more on that. And it, it's just a matter of time before I think we see some top Singaporean entrepreneurs. There's um, Razer, which is a, um, a gaming um, mouse company, which has done really well. And there's a few startups which have, which have done well based in Singapore, like Grab. Though I think the future is where we're going to see more innovation in Southeast Asia and Asia in general, especially in the startup sphere. And for instance, you, you, you live the first 15 years of your life over there. So I know that uh, from my experience and speaking with some friends and people that have been living around there, the education is very, very central in terms of the way Singapore has been becoming what it is. And I know that it's very exigent as well. So can you tell a little bit that I know that it was only 15 years and as well, yeah. you start doing work very young. So that means there's a sense, a sense of entrepreneurial spirit very young. So a yeah. bit of that background. So I, I suppose Singapore is, a, as you mentioned, super strong focus on academics. So when, when going to school in Singapore, we used to have four sets of exams a year and we would um, prepare maybe 50 days before the exams um, for, for preparation in terms of um, making sure, like say we had nine subjects, each of the exams uh, were properly prepared for. Um, I actually was very lucky to go to um, ACS, which is um, a local school in Singapore, but it's ranked, I think, one of the top three in the world for the International Baccalaureate Program. So um, extremely strong academic focus and um, also good at sports. So we, ha we had half the year where we would do sports and I used to be a, a cross-country runner and play for the football team. Then the other half, it would be entirely focused on ac academia. So in terms of the creative side, I think um, more emphasis um, could be put there. But in terms of the academics, I, I think Singapore does place super high importance on um, traditional academic learning and it's proven quite well in terms of building a a well-educated society and workforce. Yeah, and I think that is very important because education is key. And I see uh, even me living in the UK, I see the challenge even with COVID-19 that even most of the children are not having school, which is kind of crazy. But I see countries with less capacity that are having actually much better infrastructure. So I want to, I think that's probably made who you are right now for sure, uh, because education is the central element and it creates as well the discipline and the capacity. So I know that you start very young. Um, you start doing apps with 14 years old and so forth. So can you tell us about that background? And I know probably coming from your family and from the environment where you grew up, I think it's interesting to see how did you become yeah. an entrepreneur and this level and as well starting so young. Definitely. So I think my parents were a huge inspiration in that, like seeing how they managed to build a business um, um, in software and me, um, being able to go with them to conferences uh, when I was maybe 16 or, or like 14 and, and kind of learn from this entire web 2.0 world where companies were growing quickly and um, not needing physical infrastructure. I, I found it super exciting to build stuff. Um, I, I probably get, uh, tried learning to code uh, five or six times and, and um, kept giving up, but then I, 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 I really enjoyed building stuff. So um, I, I also tried to find an ecosystem in Singapore to to build alongside with, but in, uh, back in 2009, 2008, 2007, there wasn't very much going on in the, the Singapore startup ecosystem. And I think even in, in, say, the London ecosystem where I moved to for boarding school, there, wa there wasn't very much being developed there. And which is why I suppose in school, I was super excited to finish high school um, and skip university to just start building companies. And um, yeah, I was very passionate about empowering other people and, and teaching, coding, and, so that is very, it's one of the things that I, I see knowing a bit of you is that you are very focused on empowering people. So when did that start, especially for the project uh, that we're going to be talking about, your, 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 uh, that you are the founder, you need, you, need, you need ventures. But as well, it is a very strong focus on meaningfulness and empowering people. So can you tell us about that background? How, how did that start, and that, that passion as well to change and as well create social impact-driven projects? Um, absolutely. I think maybe... Cert certain people have helped me so much in, in, in my life. Um, my, my father being a, a huge uh, influence and, and several investors and entrepreneur friends who've um, maybe given me some pieces of advice or kind of opened my eyes to different 
um, thoughts and ideas. And I, I feel this responsibility where it's up to me to give back to society what I've um, benefited from. So um, the one thing I find super exciting about unit and, and unit ventures is the opportunities that we can potentially provide to people. So I, I suppose society is very much um, supporting a small demographic and the re and majority of society don't have these opportunities that um, uh, people that are very privileged, including myself, receive. Um, so I, I think it's, it's, up for, it's up to most people to realize that, hey, uh, I've been so lucky to get a education. I've been so lucky to have the support of advisors and mentors. It's, it's time to give back to society and see how we can empower and provide um, opportunities to, to other people and, and realize uh, social, socially impact, uh, meaning comes from doing socially impactful things and um, it's so important to help other people. Um, I actually started learning and studying about social impact working for uh, an investor in London called Eric Archambault and he, he started one of the, or he worked for one of the top funds in, in London called Wellington Partners and, and did a bunch of socially impactful investments and had a social impact fund and I think that kind of opened my eyes that, hey, making money is important, but it can be done with, um, while doing good. So things should be sustainable and, and impactful and meaningful alongside um, creating um, returns and, and helping um, yeah, create financially successful companies. So, so your, your background uh, touches a lot of different things from um, uh, being special. I think I would like to, to touch the Peter Thiel residence because I think Peter Thiel has this kind of massive hype and it's been seen as, a, in one end, a visionary, but at the same time, you know, like kind of a, almost a dark vader of technology. So he has like these two levels. So can you tell about that experience? I think it's quite interesting to go because you touch two very elements, both from Peter, Peter Thiel to WikiLeaks, which is quite interesting opposites, but I think they complement in a lot of ways. So the experience of Peter Thiel, I would like, to, because you were quite young and it was, uh, it was uh, the, the young, project that he has, so it's just you a big background so, of that. Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess thousands of people applied and I was lucky to be invited to San Francisco to um, be a finalist in the, in the program. And um, I think um, what, he, he, uh, what he promotes is really interesting. The idea that, hey, people should skip university and uh, build companies. I was running um, an education uh, coding education school in London at the time. So a bunch of friends wanted me to build apps for them and build websites. And I was um, really busy running a social network uh, during the week. So we, we um, had um, users in universities all across the UK and I didn't really have the time to, to build stuff for my friends, but I really wanted them to be, um, to be involved in the technology space. So one weekend I invited them all into my office in Soho, London and, um, and, and wrote a 20 hour uh, coding course. It, it, it taught people to build six different apps and um, introduce people to a bunch of different fundamentals in coding without the need to memorize or uh, learn too much theory. It was more all about creating and um, building, which is kind of like how I learned. So I, I, I'm, I'm very interested in computer science, but the way I, I got into coding and building stuff is just by experimenting and, and building projects. I, I, I built a, a book tracker when I was... 15 and, and that became quite popular and uh, um, a, a video conferencing app also with a few million users um, all by just experimenting and, and looking at open source code and building upon it. So yeah, um, I, I guess go, going back to your question, um, um, this, this, um, this way of empowering young people and giving them the resources and opportunities for me is really exciting. And it's amazing that people like Peter Thiel support this. And I, I hope that in the future I can um, give back it with unit and, and the different ventures that we're supporting in, in supporting young people. So and it, it, your experience with WikiLeaks, because I, I think it's particularly interesting because you create the app and as well, you have funding and, and managing that. So that is a particularly interesting experience. So, um, from Peter Thiel, he went to build as well something very disruptive because Peter Thiel is part of the status quo and then WikiLeaks is part of the broken status quo. So can you tell us a bit about the two experiences? So for instance, what was your experience for instance with Peter Thiel and then coming and working with something like 
WikiLeaks, which is partly represents a lot of the opposite way of looking at society. Sure. I mean, I think WikiLeaks has changed a lot in, in recent years. Um, I, I built their Android app in 2009, 2010. Um, I think um, uh, it's important. I think this openness and transparency and accountability um, in, in government and in, in societies in general. So I'm, I'm all for um, show, uh, offering transparency and, and accountability, especially in government. I, I think the way some of the way the organization is handled could be improved. So I don't believe in just dumping documents and, and um, I think it's important to be um, transparent and accountable. And, and I guess what I built was a way for people to just view um, the information. I was maybe 15 or 16 when I did it, um, when I built it. And, and yeah, it was very widely used. Um, but in terms of, um, as you mentioned, contributing to society, I think it's important to uh, be productive rather than destructive. And I think um, potentially some of the uh, work that WikiLeaks has done is um, maybe not the best in terms of just dumping documents and hoping that good comes out of it. I think a more structured approach could make sense. I understand. So, but, but as well, the, the process of building the app, we were quite young and, and building that is not a simple task, especially for a project as complex as that. So um, can you just uh, adjust on the process of building that software, especially at so, so young age, uh, which Definitely. is I mean, in itself a fantastic achievement, but uh, um, without going to leaks, I think you touched that in a very subtle way, but just understanding <laughs> are we, are we, are we the process of building something like that? Because I think that's yep. pretty interesting. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I guess I was very interested in Android development and I, I still am. And it was something which was, I felt was very important. Um, I, I offered a way. For, so the, I guess the way the organization works is it just dumps documents and it hopes that reporters would somehow pick up on, on unique pieces and, um, pieces which are worth publishing and what I built was just a way of accessing the documents and searching it and, and finding relevant pieces of information it plugged in with most of the APIs whilst it was available and then um, stopped becoming available very quickly also um, yeah in terms of I guess digital assets and cryptocurrencies which you um, which you mentioned earlier I was um, part of the initiative uh, helping lead fundraising around WikiLeaks, um, which I, I think is, is quite a strong use of digital assets and cryptocurrencies um, in terms of financing and supporting um, organizations which might not be so well supported by the current banking system. So in 2010, 2011, um, their bank accounts got frozen, MasterCard Visa got um, taken down. So I suppose that was their introduction to Bitcoin and digital assets, and I was happy to help support that. Yeah, very interesting. And so, and in another project that I think it's very interesting that you have before you go to Unit Ventures was the Love Calculator. So <laughs> I, I really like the project. And actually, we got quite, uh, it was probably, you were quite young at the time as well. But uh, can you tell us about that? Because it's, it's probably, in the end of the day, probably is a, is a dating app, Definitely. but uh, as well, yeah. you probably were 17, 18 years old when you did that as well. The, yeah, for sure. There. So I, I guess this, I, I built a number of simple apps. Um, this was one of them where it, it wasn't like a dating app, which I started later on, which um, was focused on universities. This was super simple where it would, you would input two names and we would give some advice or give some, give a calculation based on uh, these two names. So it, it was, one of these very, um, it was one of the apps I built, which was very simple and um, it became relatively popular in terms of um, providing like something fun for people to, to play with. Um, yeah, and it, it, very, very simply, we just put, input two names and we would calculate a percentage of how compatible these two people were. Uh, similar to what you see on TV is when they say, hey, you should message this number to see your, um, your, um, love compatibility or something. It was just a very fun project that took off and became quite popular. Also, I built a, a planking site. So planking was a phenomenon where people would lay down uh, in, let's say, in a plane, com a plane baggage compartment or on a railing and they would take a picture. So I built um, an app which became quite popular doing that. Um, also, the book tracker was quite popular and yeah, a bunch of very specific apps which 
um, I d solve my problem and maybe a few other people's um, problems too. Very interesting. So, so then I think all of that took you to building Unit Ventures. And as well, you built as well recently a big event that is the Global Online and Conference, which is as well, it's, it's interesting because I think all your work touches the idea of entrepreneurship, artists, investors, futurists, and change makers. And I think that's probably what is in the base of Unit Ventures. So can you tell us about how did the Unit Ventures started um, and as well, what stage it is. I know that you're doing a lot of things, creating a lot of marketplaces. But I'm interested to hear about this and then, of course, talking about the, 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 the event and the, the, the global online and, and conference. De definitely. So I guess the unit conference is inspired and very similar to this uh, concept, which is an unconference where uh, different people can propose different topics and ideas and discussions and talk about it. It was started by Tim O'Reilly in, in the early 2000s. He, he was a or well, he is a, a top technology writer and publisher. And he invited basically all the top people in Silicon Valley to his offices in south of San Francisco in, in uh, Palo Alto and, and, and allowed them to, and, and made this whiteboard and people would fill in and, and propose different talks and sessions. And yeah, I, I, I was very lucky to be invited to an unconference in 2000, 2013 when I was on a train from Paris to London and I sat across someone who was organizing an unconference. He overheard my conversation with the person next to me and said, hey, um, it, it sounds amazing, this business you're building. I'd love to invite you to this event in, in Jersey. And I said, sure, why not? So I, the following month, I, I went to the island of Jersey, south of, of the UK, and met these amazing people. And since then, we all, we've been organizing unconferences and unit conference events in maybe 18 different cities across the world, from Zurich to Bali to Hong Kong to um, Berlin to New York to Los Angeles and the goal is as you mentioned to bring futurists and entrepreneurs and change makers um, um, to together and, and sh to showcase them and we did this unit conference uh, unit online and conference um, on the 1st of May where we got uh, 300 speakers uh, to speak over 24 hours with six concurrent rooms and yeah it was a huge success and I'm very grateful for everyone's participation and very excited to do more of these. Very good. And, and as well in terms of uh, so the, the unit ventures, the company and the organization, I know that is quite ambitious and you're creating multiple marketplaces. So can you tell us how did it start? Um, how is it going? How you want? What's your vision as well on that? Definitely. So it was started by my father and I who have this belief in supporting um, supporting a way for people to um, f find work so that there's so many people now with with the coronavirus situation who maybe have had their business closed down or have lost their job and maybe are a bit uncertain in in what how they could maybe pay their rent or pay their bills and then um, there's a bunch of people who need who need who want meaning with their work so maybe they they work a corporate job which they don't enjoy or they um they, they, they enjoy doing yoga or being an artist, but they, they're unable to make a sustainable living about, of it. Or there's the reputation in society that, hey, you know, you should um, become a doctor or be a lawyer. Like, um, th I guess, suppose this is something which uh, Singapore society um, is, is known for promoting, where you, there is a bunch of stable jobs which people should strive towards. And then the artist's job, or to be a footballer, or to be a... Um, uh, to do something in the creative works, to do film is, is very shunned upon. So I, I think this idea of providing a way to um, uh, support people and make a sustainable living where they can build a, a business around um, finding, uh, finding clients for providers or providing a product or service is really exciting. So creating the Uber for different verticals, I, I think that's what uh, Unit is excited to do or what Airbnb has shown with the um, accommodation and um, property space like we're really excited to do this for se several different verticals and then um, i think you have a very interesting model that uh, that comprehends both uh, the idea of a crypto ecosystem and the token that creates a, uh, an aggregator of a mutual value creation for the company and the, uh, not the company for the the sector or for the vertical so can you explain the tokenomics around the unit ventures and as well the way you're building that and what you achieved so far? Definitely. So like, I guess what Uber has done to the, the taxi industry is really offer a way for anyone to become a, a driver. So it's not 
uh, it doesn't have these gatekeepers like uh, needing a taxi medallion or needing to be a part of a taxi company. Anyone who wants to, to provide a service as a driver is able to do so, or the way Airbnb has um, disrupted the hotel monopoly. I think we're really excited to, be, to provide this to, say, the yoga industry, where let's say if I was interested in teaching yoga, I could go on to Yoga Find and, and start giving classes after I've been approved. Or if I wanted to teach English, or if I wanted to be a coach or, or help um, sell and, and market or rent out properties, that, that's what we allow. And um, I think um, going to this point, to your question about what's so different about the way we're structuring and building these businesses is it's very much around the cooperative or the collect collective um, um, model where in, in maybe Germany and, and certain parts of Europe there were, or in the UK, there's businesses which are cooperatively owned where the employees are stakeholders in the entity. So if you use the model of Uber, where let's say I was an Uber driver in 2012, say it started in 2011, and you're a customer who, who um, I drove around, you, you clicked on an app and I came to you as a driver, the two of us got zero, zero dollars and we got none of this piece of the $60 billion um, initial public offering that Uber had in 2018 or 19. And, and, and that's, that's what I believe has created this inequity in society where there's a small number of people who are the founders and the investors in, in the founders' ideas and they re reap a lot of the benefit from society. And the employees and the customers, unfortunately, don't get to see any of this value being created. So yeah, I'm really excited to create the future of the economy where, let's say, Dennis, you have an idea and and a bunch of people can support you in that idea, and, and they very directly benefit from it um, alongside you and, and as a community. Very good. And in terms of, um, I know that you, you're working in multiple different verticals, and you have already some users of the platform, you are already creating the tokens, but as well, you have as well, part of the process is as well creating a property network. So how do you how do you juggle all of these different things? Because of course it's, it's different things, and as well the the frames to build these, and how do you want to scale it to become a global platform? And as well some of the context, both on the tokenomics, but as well in the blockchain part, and as well in infrastructure and the, and the way you you bring people to the platform. Definitely. So I, I I'm a big fan of um, physical spaces and and bringing together people in, in amazing places. So. I, I guess to answer your question is we have, we have some really good partners. In, in Bali, we're building this uh, village for entrepreneurs and artists and creatives. I'm excited to spend and be, be based there. Um, we hope to um, show this cooperative model where many people can uh, be, be um, directly um, to be invested in other people's concepts and ideas and show a society which is very much interdependent where it's not, it doesn't have stakeholders who are the customers and the founders and the investors on one side and the customers and the employees. We want to create a society where um, the, the, the customers are, are very directly benefiting from um, being part of this whole ecosystem. So if, if let's say you, you listen to an artist um, who is in our village when they're up and when when they when you notice they're they're very talented but not very well known, and and you supported them, you, you should as a fan or as a, a friend receive some of the benefit when they become a, a huge name. So we're trying to see how we can use blockchain and um, digital assets tokens to support this um, way of redefining value and society, which I, I think is arguably more transformative than the mobile phone or the internet. Okay. So and and so from a, from the usage of crypto. So I, I think I want to touch a bit the crypto and the blockchain. So there's there's a lot of right now trends in crypto, and of course crypto is becoming a right now mainstream completely from Libra to a lot of and there's kind of more centralized versions and more decentralized versions. There's more people in the area of Ethereum or Bitcoin or or even a lot of alternative coins, stable coins and things like that. So do you aim to really make the token and the center of the community to become a, a big, bigger um, vision for that? Or for now, you're using just that as a tool to engage the community and to create the token or utility around the different sectors that we are bringing to the community? 
I think it's all about showing successful use cases. So I think if you look at the crypto space or the blockchain space, we, we, we haven't seen very much. We, we've shown, shown some very good use cases and some exciting things with potential. But in terms of being able to see something like um, Airbnb or Google or um, projects which, which have come from an idea to a very successful business, um, we, we haven't seen so many of that. But very similar to how um, I, I remember in 2012, people saying, hey, you know, Bitcoin's now $100. I can, I can imagine it, it's going to be 100 times what it is. You know? And people would say, one Bitcoin worth $10,000, that's ridiculous. You know? So I think the same way, people, a lot of people don't see how um, token, a tokenized economy or um, tokens play a mainstream use in day-to-day -day life um, becoming a reality. I think it's just a matter of um, showing successful use cases. And I think it's a matter of maybe three to five years away before hopefully projects um, like Ethereum, Polkadot, um, uh, maybe Libra show some use case in terms of maybe banking the unbanked or providing financing to projects without the need to go through traditional venture capitalists or providing um, a way to, to help bridge this inequity. I think to go back a, a bit, what's driving me is solving this inequity in the world and providing opportunities to people who might not have these opportunities because of information being um, not so accessible or uh, resources not being as well um, distributed as they could be. Yeah, and I think that is a big challenge right now with everything happening in the world, especially with COVID-19. And as well, this is accelerating in one end, the digital transformation. And so a lot of things that would take probably 10 years are right now being accelerated in one year or two. But this Definitely. is it's creating as well a lot of uh, issues, especially because um, one of the paradox, if you look purely on data, is that although the financial industry is mostly digitized, we have a challenge that um, the rest of the world economy is not digitized at all, it's still paper. For instance, if you see any bank transfer around the world, including over there in Singapore, you need paper authorizations. And even in the UK, that is the, probably the, one of the most advanced, you still have a lot of things that if you don't have, like, uh, to create a bank account, you take probably 10 days or even 20 or even months. Um, and, and even with, when you have, like, already something, it, it's a complete nightmare. So how do you tackle this? And as well, being based right now... Um, uh, in Indonesia, you have as well one of the countries that actually is, is going to be, I think, in 2050, um, the fifth economy in the world, and as well Absolutely. one of the biggest populations. So, I'll, and as well, I, I've been studying actually, I did a couple of conferences over there actually with the central bank and the union, the organization of banks, that it's actually becoming quite digitized. I think actually Indonesia is one of the biggest powerhouses in terms of software development in the world and as well uses of social media. So we have a lot of paradox that in Europe probably don't understand the rest of the world. But so can you tell us a bit about that bridge and as well uh, the different ways of facing entrepreneurs? Because like, you, like we discussed, um, you touched that at the moment, a lot of people are really struggling. Uh, actually, most of the people, for instance, in the UK alone is, I think, one in seven businesses in furlough, and not one in seven people is in furlough, or two. In the US, there's around 40 million people in employed, and this is US, so we're not even talking as well. COVID is actually going in second velocity for Africa and for emerging markets. So that's, although I think, to be honest, I think Southeast Asia really managed it much better than actually other countries. But I, I would like to have you a bit of your insights on that. And as well, like you said, you're building property, so it's something that needs people, that need face-to-face, -face. and at the same time, you are software developer, so you have the two things that you have to juggle together. Definitely. I mean, I think the reason why Asia is doing so well with the current COVID situation is because in 2005, I remember being in school and having to use a thermometer because of the SARS situation. So I think after SARS, um, the whole of Asia just became um, aware to how severe a, a pandemic could be. And they wanted to make sure that when this um, coronavirus situation emerged, they were extremely well prepared. And, and, and also on, um, addressing your, your, what your question earlier about um, how emerging markets can um, maybe potentially leapfrog these more developed markets. I think it's a huge opportunity for a, a country like Indonesia, um, places in Africa, maybe South America, so Venezuela, Argentina, are able to sort of leapfrog the, the the Western world, which um, has these gatekeepers and entities to um, maybe prevent innovation or social mobility. I I'm really excited for that aspect where 
um, financial services, which have done so much to progress society, is provided in a fair and democrat, um, transparent way uh, to to the six billion people who um, w- would would benefit so much from it. I completely, and that I think is going to be much more. So, so would you say that uh, from your experience, uh, well, having uh, been born and grew up in Singapore, then coming to the UK and now being in Indonesia, and as well with all this global footprint, how do you see this geopolitics as well in terms of both technology and day-to-day life and as well culture? Because there's a lot of different nuances of the culture, but in the end of the day, we are all part of this together, and I think we cannot just put. Uh, I think this division that we see, especially in some countries. It's not going to, to build anything, just destroy, but it, it takes us probably out of the focus of the problems that we are facing right now. And I would like to hear, and I know that Unit Ventures is precisely built for that, but just understand more, uh, how do you look at that as, as you build these communities and you look, for instance, I saw in your platform, you have like yoga communities, you have a lot of different things that are quite different, but as well, very interesting. So just understand a bit of uh, the way the Unit Ventures, um, are you are building it and as well, um, nurturing these relationships as well. Definitely. So I guess the way Univentures is built is it's very much around jobs which we would like to create in society or jobs which we believe to be essential pieces which we want to help develop. So like you mentioned, we have yoga, we have coaching, we've got education, we've got um, maybe partying, we've got property, we have, we have cars and, and also trying to see how we can make um, these different professions may be more progressive or also sustainable. So maybe like cars, how we can promote maybe electric cars or how we can uh, provide um, community living um, to tackle maybe mental health issues or uh, loneliness uh, for, for the property space. So we're trying to see how we can use sustainable, regenerative, um, some people say more conscious um, ways of living towards these very traditional industries and introducing new ideas now, now society is working from home and, and people want to do what they enjoy uh, doing rather than work which they might not find so meaningful. So we're trying to see how we can provide a very efficient way of them doing it and provide the flexibility and freedom um, for, for them to do it too. And also one thing which we haven't touched on, sorry, please. No, 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 go ahead. Sorry. One thing we sorry. haven't touched on is how I, I, I'm really excited for how blockchain is going to commoditize the... Um, the application layer of the internet. So I, I think um, the internet um, hardware goes in, um, goes in, into, well, the technology industry goes in cycles. So before you had a certain piece of hardware, like uh, compact and um, um, different hardware manufacturers, and then it, the hardware didn't mat- uh, matter, it was the operating system. And then the operating system didn't matter because it was the browser which mattered. And then the browser didn't matter, it was the, things on the browser which mattered. So I'm, I'm really excited. We have a few different um, companies which control like a, a ridiculous amount of value and wealth like Facebook, Google, uh, Amazon. And, and I think what's going to happen is that there's going to be a commoditization of these different systems. And I think blockchain and um, tokenized systems provide this uh, platform. And that's what's going to disrupt these huge companies. Yeah, I'm eager for that. And especially as well, the, the ownership of data and different areas like financial services and financial exactly. inclusion. So you, your platform is, is uh, we are a pro, uh, our, our podcast is called Cities ABC. So you have a huge component of cities um, mm-hmm. and as well. So you have from Asia, Middle East and Africa, Europe, North and South America. So can you tell us this relationship that you're building with the cities? Is this you have ambassadors, you are creating with your adventures and things? So our goal is to build out this network in 200 cities in the next three years. So we have ambassadors in different continents, and regions, and cities. And we're all about how to uh, re- regenerate these communities and societies. So um, before you mentioned about how um, a lot of companies are moving towards populist governments and people are very upset about the, the maybe immigrants coming in or they want to close up their borders to keep it more nationalistic or, or glo- globalistic. I think this is very much... Um, a bad direction and I think it's largely something that people have blamed um, uh, b- because of this inequity and I don't think the inequity is, is because of the world moving towards this globalized more connected world it's to do with the way value is distributed so I think the way 
structures and corporations are set up where they're essentially machines driving shareholder value and serving the founders as well as their few investors. I think um, this cooperative model is going to make those investors and founders significantly more money whilst providing a nicer, a more um, equitable setup for the middle class and, and for everyone else. Very interesting. And coming back to the to the blockchain and the, like you mentioned, I think it's particularly interesting is the blockchain and the commodity commoditization of value, and as well the supply chain. So, for instance, if I look right now at the Unit Ventures, you have a lot of different companies from health advisors to film, model, find, sound, find, and all of these kind of different verticals. And then you have the daily token, the token find, and the, and the, as well things like this. So, how do you? manage these different areas and as well how do you control the utility part of the token the security and as well all the the practicality of creating value for the business in the end of the day the token is worthless if it doesn't create value like you said for the community so this is particularly important how do you manage this definitely so i think we're um the most important thing is is the, the end user the customer so we're, we're making sure that the, the customer who's looking for the service as well as the provider who's looking for the customer is, is taken care of. And if we make sure that the customers are happy because they can easily find uh, someone to provide them a product or a service and a provider who's uh, selling property or teaching lessons um, maybe um, can wake up in the morning and, and receive three new clients and not have to worry about putting food on the table or um, having majority of their earnings being taken by a middleman, then I, I think we're doing a good job. And I think th this, the key is how can we build systems supporting the end user. And if we're able to do that, then um, I believe this cooperative model will thrive um, where, where we put the, the, the customer and we put the um, different stakeholders first. So instead of um, different platforms treating the end user as the product, like maybe certain social networks, which simply sell ads to, to providers and treat the users as um, something that they take advantage of and, and um, um, maybe play around with how they can uh, take as much time from their day to spend on their platform. How, how can we treat these as being the, um, the most important part of the ecosystem and the, um, of all the stakeholders? Completely. So that, that is a very interesting thing. So um, well, we, we are right now and the, the benchmark of one hour in the interview. So, so I, I just want to like as a, the last question and as well, probably touching uh, still the vision that you have for the community. And I think that's particularly interesting for us and for our audience. So from these 200 cities that you build in the network worldwide uh, to a decentralized model and as well to the tokenization, how do you right now are planning to orchestrate uh, this, uh, this uh, um, visionary project and put it together? in a way that it scales to get millions of users or at least a meaningful community around the world. And as well, if you can tell some of the numbers that you have right now. Definitely. So um, off the transactions, we take um, a percentage cut. We take an 8% cut. And half of that is, is given to um, agents and, and pe people who are helping us grow our network. So um, w the way we think of it is there's either product providers or products or services. There are people who are clients of these providers of products and services. And then there's managers who are basically uh, supporting the providers of products and services as well as sourcing the clients. So um, in terms of how we're building up this distributed network around the world, we, we basically have ambassadors in each of these cities, um, these 200 cities, and as well as continents who manage these different cities. And our goal is to see how, how we can, say, create 1,000 jobs in, in this city. And then from there, we, we kind of build it up. I, I'm, I'm super passionate about how we can um, become the leading marketplace um, owned and, and cooperatively managed by our ecosystem. So our goal is, is to see how in the next uh, two and a half years, three years, we can have a meaningful presence in all these 200 cities and be the leading marketplaces across these uh, verticals that we've identified. No, very good. Well, uh, amazing. And um, I wish you all the luck and as well success for this. And I think it's already a success. Um, probably as a last uh, point of touch, uh, can you tell us a bit where people can find about you besides the social media, but we'll put all the links to, to you. But as well, how do you want people to approach your project? 
let's say if there's a company, if there's an organization, or some case study that you want to use as a last moment to engage people. I think it's particularly important right now. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm super excited to see how to collaborate and, and partner with whoever's interested. Uh, my email is m at mihealy.com, M-I-H-E-A-L-Y.com. Um, my uh, u- username on Telegram is Michael. And if you go into uh, unitnetwork.org or if you go into unit.ventures, you can uh, find out more information. And yeah, I'd I love to, to, to discuss working together or collaborating. Thank you. Thank you so much. No, it's amazing. So thank you so much for having for for uh, for being here, Michael. It's been a pleasure, and I I wish really the best for Unit Ventures, and I'm sure that uh, we, we'll have a big a big success or a continuation of big success, and uh, we'll be here as well to promote it. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thanks so much. Thanks.